lesson number seven of our, of our 12 week course, Communion with God. This course is an amazing course that is blessing a lot of people, and I'm so glad that you're getting blessed. We praise God. Thank you for coming on, and for those who will be watching the video, we thank God for you. We pray that the video will be alive for you and that you will learn and grow from it. And so we give God the praise. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. I pray that you start each day with worship and praise because that's our purpose. We were made to worship him. Psalm 139, 14 says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made that we might worship him. And so we bless you. We greet you. We send a shout out to you, Patricia, and to Mark Wolverton, and to all of our classmates. Praise God, all of, all of our attendant, attendant, attendees. Uh, Jessica Katz, we greet you. Uh, Christy Carpenter, we greet you. Lisa Yaton, we greet you. And we greet at Marcus, and we greet Patricia Hoffman, and Roy Rosser, and everyone else. We greet those of you who will be watching via the video. Praise God. We're moving right along. We are over halfway through this course. Just five more weeks, and we will be finished. What a ride. We welcome and greet you, Ted Rowe, and um, anyone else whose names we have not called. So let's open up. Let's begin with prayer. Let's ask uh, Pastor Mark Wolverton to lead us in prayer tonight. Brother Mark, please pray for us. Father God, we just. Oops. Turn up my mic or hit. Is mine too loud? In yours, Mark. How about me? Am I too loud? Yes, yours is too loud. So turn down the volume on your computer, Marcus. We'll wait for you. Hello? Thanks, Katz. Hello. That's good, Mark. That's great. Okay. Praise God. Father God, we just come before you. We ask that you bless each one tonight. That you bless the Carters as they continue to go down this road. We thank you for them. We pray blessings and strength upon them. And you bless each student as we go through this together. Thank you that we hear your voice and that you speak to us so clearly. In Jesus' name, and amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God, Pastor Marcus Wolverton, our friend in uh, Lafayette, Indiana. Praise God. Amen. And friends, uh, class, class, let's get started with this lesson seven tonight. Look for vision as you pray. Look for vision as you pray and already we're getting we're getting exciting reports from you about how you're hearing from god and how you're uh finding that quiet place and and getting into that into the presence of the lord and hearing his voice tonight we're going to look at uh the tabernacle and, and we want to introduce you to you the tabernacle prayer experience that's awesome so we have the habakkuk prayer experience tonight we're going to get the tabernacle prayer ex prayer experience as you learn how to pray picturing the tabernacle that god commanded moses to build the tabernacle was a replica of the heavenly throne room and then later the temple was a permanent building built on the tabernacle model and the tabernacle and the temple are uh, replicas of our human body as as our our body represents the the temple of god our body is the temple of god and you're going to learn about that so as we look tonight we look to learn about how to pray the tabernacle experience and once you get this concept down and begin praying at the different stations of the tabernacle you're going to be blessed beyond measure i want to thank elisa byron for sending us the um the diagram that we'll be use, using as our model tonight, 
Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Alisa, and we just praise God. We bless God for what he's doing. Then he said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. And I speak to him in a dream. That's Numbers 12, 6. O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people, and prepare their heart unto thee. First Chronicles 29, 18. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he says, what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall dream dreams. Your old men, your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Acts 2, 17. So we just thank God. We uh, worship you, Lord God. We praise you. We honor you. We love you, Lord God. We lift up holy hands to you. We thank you, Father, that we can come to you in the mighty name of Jesus and learn more about you and to be in your presence. So it's with an attitude of worship, God, and humility in our hearts that we come to you tonight and, and study together. We bless you and praise you and honor you. Teach us how to approach you through the tabernacle experience, the tabernacle model. Help us to learn about the six pieces of furniture in the tabernacle and what they stand for. And then help us to continue, God, using the model that Habakkuk has given unto us for approaching you. And we thank you for what our Lord and Savior Jesus taught us about how to approach the Father. So teach us how to pray. Teach us how to worship you and and Help us to continue putting our trust in you, and we thank you. Here's a personal note. Uh, using vision, and this is something you'll be journaling on, present yourself before each piece of the tabernacle furniture. Fix your eyes upon Jesus and ask what he wants to speak to you about the placement of this experience in your life. Tune to spontaneity and write down the flow of spontaneous thoughts that come back. You may, you may say, well, this course is crazy. We're doing some crazy things. But you know, these crazy things are working and getting us closer to God. And we walk by faith, not by sight. We're doing things that we haven't done before. And we're walking by faith. We're trusting God's word. And what God's word says, we're doing it. It's different from what we've been trained to do in the church but we're we're learning how to seek God for ourselves and to put our trust in his word and we're not afraid to grow God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind so if you open your binder we we'll look at tonight's objectives the objectives for this week and then we're going to look at our specific assignments for this coming week for lesson number seven so turn with me to page 15 of your binder and then i think we need to go back to we, then we flip back to page eight of your student binder and the assignment to be completed for lesson seven well, we eliminated the test, so you don't have to complete test one. Prayerfully read chapter 7 of Four Keys to Hearing God's Voice. Then prayerfully read from Dialogue with God. Read chapter 4 in Dialogue with God. Listen to session 7 of the teaching, which we will do later on when we listen to Dr. Verkler's seventh audio. And then complete the related exercises in your student notebook. We are to memorize this week the scripture John 8, 38a. And that scripture says to us, I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Note, 
Jesus says, I speak the things which I have seen of my father. So vision is important. Jesus used vision. He operated in vision. The things he saw his father do, those were the things he spoke, he taught, and he did. I, he said, I don't do anything unless I see my father do it. And so we're to model after Christ and, and do what he shows us to do. Okay, uh, then correct, complete and correct self-test number seven. Do your self-test. You don't have to send your self-test to me, uh, but take the self-test and just to see where you're doing in the course and on this particular subject. So we thank God. We praise God. And as an addition, should you have time, we don't make this a priority, but you have the Freedom Diaries. And you can look at the journaling, some of the journaling in the Freedom Diaries as we continue with, with the course. Now flip over in your student uh, workbook in your binder to page 13. And we will look, I'm sorry, page 15 in your student binder. We'll look at the specific questions you'll be answering in your homework that you're to turn in to me for lesson seven. Number one, write out John 838a. John 838a. We just share that scripture. I speak the things which I have seen with my father. I speak the things which I have seen with my father. That's Jesus speaking and he gives us the, the key to vision and praying uh, the vision and, and operating in the vision. Journal, journal about what this scripture means to you. So not only are we asking you to write out the scripture, but journal, write out in, in, in your journal and send it to me what this scripture is speaking to you. Journaling, uh, you're veterans now and, and, and um, most of you have really caught on the journaling and you're doing well. Um, some of you still need to learn how to quiet yourself down. Find that place. Ask God to help you to find that place where you can uh, be at peace, where it's quiet. Uh, no television, no uh, interruptions. And dedicate that time to God. Let God know, God, I'm here. I'm in your presence. Help me to quiet your mind. Some of you are still having trouble quieting your mind. Turn your mind off. Tell your mind. Speak to your mind. Prophesy to your mind. Say, mind, I want you to rest. I'm going to yield you, surrender you to the Holy Spirit. I want you to get into the flow of the Holy Spirit. And then talk to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, rise up in me. Bubble up in me. Naba. Bubble up in me like rivers of living water. Let the rivers flow up. See, God has a river that flows from the throne of God. It transcends time and space and now lives inside of every believer. And yes, you can hear from God. Learn how to hear from God. Learn how to quiet yourself down. And when you quiet yourself down and put your thoughts in their particular place, and, and seek God's thoughts. God said, your thoughts are not my thoughts. My thoughts are not your thoughts. But when we begin listening to his thoughts, Jesus gives us a key in John 38, 838a. He said, I speak the things which I see with, I've seen with my father. So find that quiet place. Jesus would go up on the mountain to find the quiet place. He would just walk away from his disciples and go to a place on the mountain, and he'd be alone with his father. You may not have a mountain to climb. You may not have a hill to climb. You might ha not have a cabin in your backyard. It might be in a room in your house. It might be in a corner of your, your living room. It might be in your bedroom. It might be your bed. But there's a quiet place where you can go. I've had students say, I lock myself in my car. I go outside and sit in my car. Uh, uh, we've got some of our students, they're truckers. They're on the road all the time. And so uh, they're, they, find, they find that quiet place and, and 
and tune into spontaneity and look for vision look for vision look for a visual picture or words from the lord as you practice and uh, uh nobody taking this course can say i can't do it uh uh, it takes time for for everybody. There may be people saying who are saying, "I'm not doing this yet, yet." But don't say I can't do it, because God has given us a left brain and a right brain, and when we allow both hemisphere, hemispheres of the brain to work together, we can do it. But the thing is, uh, most of us have gone through our whole lives not embracing quiet. We, we have to have music, we've got to have noise, we've got to have the TV, we've got to be talking on the cell phone, we've got to be doing this. But ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing like quiet. So learn how to go to that quiet place. Find that quiet place. Quiet yourself down and, and, and tune in to the Lord and, and talk to the Lord and listen to him. Many of us grew up learning how to pray and, and, and we, we do all the talking. From the time we say, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. We were taught to talk, to do the talking, but God wants to talk. So we, we're learning how to be listeners. Yes, music helps us. Soft music helps us. I, 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 I have, my thing is, my Saturday afternoon bath, I go into the bathtub two hours i'm in that hot tub and and i don't have soft music i i just sing i pray in tongues i praise god i worship god and i just it just i just let the the hot water soothe my aching bones and my muscles and 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 it's just like it's just like going on vacation cats it's like going on vacation every saturday i'm up, up and away, up, up and away, zip, zoom, I'm out of here, uh, uh, getting lost, finding that place in God where he can minister to me. Then after I sing praises unto the Lord and pray and, and praise him, then I, I just tune in the quiet and let the Lord speak to me. He, he speaks to me. It, it might help you if you do that to have a notepad near your bed or your or in your quiet place or uh, near your bathtub. Have a notepad and uh, try not to get it wet while you're writing. But God is going to speak to you. He's going to say things to you and uh, he will bless you. So praise God. Learn how to be quiet before the Lord. OK, write out and memorize key number three which is part of your lesson. That's number two. Number three, the author lists 18 references to dream or vision on page 170 of four keys to hearing God's voice. So turn to uh, page uh, 170 uh, in your study and look at those 18 references to dreams or vision. Uh, it says, part A, look up all of these verses no, don't look up all 18 verses, ladies and gentlemen. Don't look up all 18 verses. Just write a summary, okay? Just take a few verses and write. A, you know, we have a heart here in this course. We have a heart. Uh, uh, Mark Verkler wrote the book. I'm not saying Mark doesn't have a heart, but Mark wrote a tremendous book, and it's a tremendous course, but we're just going to modify. We're going to modify this textbook. and. Uh, that's why when uh, Pastor Paul and I, when we chose this curriculum for our school, we realized now that the curriculum is ours, we can modify it to ad adapt it to our school and to our students. So you don't have to uh, write a summary of all 18 verses. Just take a few of them. Ask the Lord through journaling if there's anything he wants to say to you specifically through each verse. No, we modify that also. Here's the way I did it when I took this course a year ago. I took uh, a few of the verses and I read them and I said, now, Lord, what is it you would like to speak to me through these verses? OK, so I did not journal on each verse. and We're not asking you to journal on each verse just take a few verses ask the lord lord what is it you would like to say to me about these verses and then i'll journal what god gives you 
Praise God. Once you have prayerfully, prayerfully looked at all these verses, write a summary of what you believe is the place of dream and vision in our communication with the Lord. Just write a brief summary of what you believe is the place of dream and vision in our communication with the Lord. Jesus has already said to us, I speak the things which I see my father do. Okay, so the things I see him do, that's what I speak. So Jesus gives us a hint as to the place that dream and vision had in his ministry and in his life. Question number four, list the five kinds of visions given by the author. So you check out what the author says about the five kinds of visions. And then have you experienced any of these kinds of visions? Uh, describe one example from each type. And if you don't have five types, just take, describe one example. Describe one summary example. Okay, modify it. Modify this question. You don't have to give an example for each one if you don't have an example. If you want to, that's all right with you. Question number five in our homework, we're looking on page 16 of our student binder. In your own words, discuss the contrast the author makes between setting a scene in your mind and worshiping an image. Look at what Dr. Berkler says about setting a scene in your mind and worshiping an image. Okay, and you'll get a lot of this out of your learn book, the learn book. Um, is there's a good teaching about making sure we're not worshiping an idol. Okay, uh, setting a scene. Dr. Berkler shows you how to set a scene. And he often tells us, teaches us to picture Jesus. You're walking with him along a beach, along the shore, along the mountaintop, along the trail. You're, you're and out in, in, in the backyard. You're an eight-year-old child. You're playing with Jesus, and you take his hand. And he holds your hand. Okay, so set the scene. Become as a little child, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, be, don't be too proud to humble yourself before the Lord. Today, when I was walking on the mountain trail, and I said, Lord Jesus, take my hand. Just take my hand and guide me as I walk. And so here's this 75-year-old man saying, Lord, take my hand and guide me. Let me walk with you. And so this is how you get uh, communicate with God and, and, and look for vision. Look for vision. Look for, look for Jesus. Set a vision of Jesus in your mind's eye. Let Jesus be on the screen of your mind. Uh, not an idol. Not a problem. Not a person. Not money. Not what your situation is. No, no, no. Remove the idols and let Jesus be preeminent. Let him, uh, let him take the stage of your mind. Let him be on the screen of your mind. Visualize Jesus. And then uh, number six, carefully read the summary so far concerning dreams and visions beginning on page 183. Okay, um, and answer that particular question. The last question in our assignment for this week, complete the personal application ex exercises, exercises at the end of chapter seven of Four Keys to Hearing God's Voice. So that's your assignment. Um, this course, this course will probably be the most difficult course you take in the Paul Bakley School of Prophecy, but this course lays down a foundation, a firm, strong foundation for each of our students. So we want you to master each step, each chapter, each question, chapter by chapter, precept upon precept, and and uh, listen to the tapes and and. And learn for what you learn from this course is going to set uh, an example for the remaining co remaining courses that you take in this school. Each course is built upon this one. It's an amazing course. This course, Communion with God, is life changing. It has changed my life. It is changing your life. I praise God. I thank God for what He is doing. So that's the homework assignment um, for this coming week. And I'd like 
to ask you now if there's anyone who would like to unmute your phone and ask any questions or Jackie's monitoring the chat room and so is uh, Pastor Mark Wolverton. If you have any questions you want to put in the chat window or ask the questions, you may at this time unmute your phone and ask any questions relative to the lesson. Lisa, you may unmute your phone, Lisa. I'm sorry, I didn't have a question. I was just trying to fix the, um, I'm just trying to fix something on the computer. Okay, you all right, Lisa? I'm fine, thank you. Okay, okay, because my, my message says, can you make me the presenter? I thought maybe you wanted to teach the course. You can if you want to. No, I do not. <laughs> I hit the wrong button. Okay, <laughs> okay, God bless you, Lisa. And God bless you. You're doing a great job, by the way. Praise God. All right. Anyone else? Anyone have any questions? I don't have a question, but I just wanted to give a, a word of praise. Hey, you know, just thankful, thankful for this class. I, you know, it's it's been real helpful to this point, and uh, I've been learning a lot from it. Praise God, praise God. And you're doing a great job, Roy. And I can see the growth. I can see the growth, and uh, it got not only for you, Roy, but for everyone on on the course tonight. God's got a plan for you. God has a plan. So if you just patiently wait on the Lord and, and work your way through this course, every one of you, you're doing a great job. We want to encourage you. But I want you to know that this course is going to be life-changing, and it's not in vain. God's got the plan for you, and you'll see it uh, un unfold, unwind uh, at his appointed time. Thank you, Roy. Anyone else want to share anything? I like hearing people say the course is helping you. Anyone else? Anyone else want to say that? Just uh, how the course is helping you. Oh, uh, please don't come on. Uh, if if you don't say anything, uh, then I don't want you to say, "Man, this course is a bummer, man. This course is a bummer, man." man. Anybody want to just you know give us a little shout out for the course? It has really helped me, Dr. Carter. Bless you, Shelly. Shelly, I thank you for getting me off the hook, Shelly. I was out there. You yeah. know, Shelly, you, you, we all, we all want to be stroked, don't we? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Praise God. I, Praise I, God. I really, have, I really have been enjoying it. In fact, I was thinking today that it's, it's about half over, and I'm going to be sad to see it when it's done, you know, the class is done. Praise God, praise God. But at what we have for you after this course is a treat, a treat. So we'll be talking to you about that in, in a couple of weeks. Okay, thank you so much, Shelly. Thank you. Thank you, Shelly. Yeah. I, li I like Shelly. Shelly said, Pastor Carter's out there on the hook, man. He He's asking someone, come on, stroke this course. So she, uh, she jumped right in there. Way to go. Way to go, Shelly. Okay. Okay, praise God. Uh, tonight we want to take a look at the tabernacle experience. And I want to thank um, Alisa Byron for sending us this schematic. And it's a schematic of the tabernacle, which was the temporary tent, the temporary tent that Moses was commanded to build in the wilderness. And everywhere they traveled, they put up the tabernacle, the tent. Then eventually, Solomon built the temple. Here's a model of the temple if you're looking on your screen. Uh, Alisa is in the class that preceded you guys, so she sent that to us. Thank you, Jackie. The tabernacle schematic. Imagine now, this is, uh, this is all tent made out of uh, skins, the whole thing. It uh, has certain length and width and has an entrance. And then you have the outer courtyard of the tabernacle. And then you have the holy place, certain pieces of furniture in the outer courtyard, certain pieces of furniture in the uh, holy place. And then the holy of holies, where we find the Ark of the Covenant. We enter through the gate and we enter with praise in our lips. A lot of times uh, when I'm starting to pray and if I'm praying the 
tabernacle prayer model, I'll start with something like, I will enter your gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter your courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for you have made me glad. So whether I'm going in our prayer room or I'm on the mountain trail or I'm outside in my garden or just sitting on the porch or uh, just laying down on the bed. If I want to pray and I want to enter, I always like to enter into my prayer time with praise in my heart. Praise and worship gets God's attention, ladies and gentlemen. So wherever you are, enter his courts with praise. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Now there are times when we pray, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have time to go through this whole prayer uh, tabernacle model thing. But I want you to learn the tabernacle model uh, tonight. There are times when we have to throw up an emergency prayer unto the Lord. And uh, there are times like the lady in Philadelphia who was uh, being, uh, two guys try to rape her in the parking lot, a dark parking lot one night. She did not have time to do the tabernacle prayer thing and visit the six pieces of furniture. So uh, she learned how to uh, uh, repel a rapist by going in the tongue she began immediately she didn't have time to go and start praising god and i enter into your gates with thanksgiving in my heart she started praying in tongues and the 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 accosters flee, fled they left the place and ladies and gentlemen i te i've been teaching people this for years if if you're in an emergency situation and you need immediate help from the lord pray in tongues Pray in tongues. You'll learn about praying with praying in tongues as we continue along. Get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Ask God for his gift of tongues. And if you don't have tongues, pray. Pray. Call when you call upon the name of Jesus, whether you're in tongues or in English, Jesus shows up. He shows up because the scripture does not lie. God says, Call unto me, I will answer you. I'll show you great and mighty things which you know not. So whatever works for you, ladies and gentlemen, but tonight we want to look at this model, the tabernacle model for prayer. Every portion of the tabernacle has furniture. You enter into the gates. When you enter into the gates, it's just like going into the church building or entering the throne room of heaven or entering into your prayer room. Uh, to me, every morning I take a two-mile walk. So when I start on my trail, I enter into the gates. When I start on the trail, I'm entering into the presence of God, ladies and gentlemen. Whether it's a building, whether it's in a tent, whether it's in a prayer room, whether it's in your vehicle, whether it's in your bedroom, or whether you're in the open spaces in the cornfield or in your garden, you enter into his presence. So there's an entrance. The next piece of furniture is the altar of burnt offerings. That's where when the people brought their offerings to the priest, the priest would slay the offering and the blood would be spread on the altar and burnt unto the, the altar. The sacrifice was burnt unto the Lord. And this altar, ladies and gentlemen, in the modern day church, the altar represents Jesus Christ on the cross. Visualize when, when you enter to your prayer room, the first piece of furniture is the altar of burnt offerings. Visualize Jesus Christ on the cross and, and thank him for dying on the cross. Thank him for taking away your sins. Thank him for becoming your propitiation, your substitute. And then uh, keep in mind that he did not stay on that cross. Thank him for dying and raising himself on the third day and ascended into heaven. And thank him for uh, sending the Holy Spirit. Then the next piece of furniture is the laver. 
after the priests receive the offering from the people and they slaughter the offering and and uh burnt the offering on the the offer on the burnt offering altar then the priests had to wash their hands and their feet so this labor had a a a tub on the top and a tub on the bottom and they washed their hands and their feet of the blood and 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 the dirt uh, uh anything that was unclean and then after the late and the labor ladies and gentlemen is has a place in our hearts um the labor is where we lay down our lives before god and so you ask yourself ask god god is there any area of my life that i've not laid it down to you any area in my life that i've not surrendered to you is there any area in my life where now i'm still operating in the desires of my flesh and so it's at the labor where we wash and and we ask god wash us with the pure water of the word the pure water of the word that is why we study scripture the pure water of the word washes us of uncleanness and then the next um, station in the tabernacle is the holy place uh, certain people could uh, congregate in the outer courtyard, okay? People could congregate in the outer courtyard, but only certain people could go into the holy place. The priests went, the priest, they went into the holy place. And here, there were certain pieces of furniture. You had your table of showbread. Every seven days, they would, had to change the bread. The priests and their families would eat the old bread, put fresh bread on the table and the fresh bread the table of showbread uh reminds us of um the word of god jesus is the word of god but also the table of showbread reminds us that the bread was made out of uh flour so the 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 wheat had to be grind down ground down to flour in other words our will we must humble ourselves be willing to humble your will and submit your will to the will of god so the table of showbread is important then we had the menorah the candle the candlesticks the seven candlesticks inside the holy place and we ask the holy spirit uh, to enlighten our minds that candlestick re refers to the light that the lord has placed in us Enlighten our minds, uh, 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 remove all those uh, thoughts that are not of God. Uh, put your mind on the Lord, and as you pray, keep your mind on Jesus. Uh, put those, Satan's going to try to put thoughts in your mind when you're praying, and you've got to cast down those vain imaginations. And then we have in the holy place the altar of incense, the altar of incense, which represents our emotions. And so uh, you can't approach, you can't re cannot really approach someone if you've got bitterness in your heart to somebody, or you've got an attitude, or you, you're angry with someone. God's not going to hear our prayers. The scripture says, if I, if I regard iniquity in my heart, he won't even hear me. So we've got to be clean. We've got to enter in with thanksgiving in our heart, even when we're hurting, ladies and gentlemen enter into god's presence with thanksgiving and joy and then at the altar thank the lord thank jesus for dying on the cross for your sins thank him for making it possible for you to be reconciled with god worship him and honor him and then at the labor uh uh pray that god will cleanse you cleanse you cleanse me lord with the pure water of your word cleanse me remove mine iniquities as far as the east is from the west then enter by faith into the holy place and uh, partake of the the bread of life jesus said he's the bread of life lord jesus feed me till i want no more that's what i pray when i enter into the holy holy place lord you're the bread of life uh, i take up the show bread uh, you're the bread of life feed me help me to study your word to study to show myself approved unto you a workman who needs not to be ashamed in other words personalize this tabernacle ladies and gentlemen personalize it imagine you're in the throne room of god personalize it and then uh the candlestick 
every church, when you go into a church, there are candlesticks. Those candlesticks represent the light of the Lord. There was only one light in the holy, in the tabernacle, and that light came from God, came from God. Uh, the priests were to light a lamp and keep that light lit all the day long. But the real light in the tabernacle, in the holy place, in the real uh, tabernacle, the heavenly tabernacle, is the light of God. There be no need for electricity, no light switches in heaven. The light that comes from God will light up heaven. There be no darkness, no need to turn the lights on and off. And then we have the altar of incense. The altar of incense. Uh, when I pray at the altar of incense, uh, whether I'm on my daily walk or in my daily prayer time, I'm asking the Lord, Lord, Holy Spirit. I'm asking the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, uh, take my prayers into the nostrils of God. Let my prayers become a sweet fragrance, a sweet incense in God's nostrils, uh, uh, a sweet taste in his in his mouth uh, a sweet sound in his ears and then lord uh convert my praise and my worship and and take my prayers and my praise and my worship into the nostrils of god that it would be a sweet smelling fragrance in his nostrils so and in order to reach that place with god you can't have any bitterness towards anyone confess any root of bitterness any anger towards anyone uh if you regard iniquity in your heart god won't hear you so we've got to confess our sins as we approach god the objective ladies and gentlemen the whole objective of the tabernacle was to enter into the holy of holies the objective in the church building is to enter into the holy of holies few people realize that when they enter into the door of the church their objective is to get into the presence of God, the Holy of Holies, and rejoice in God's presence. But there are so many distractions in the church, so many distractions in our homes, so many distractions on our jobs. So we've got to learn how to enter into God's presence, find that quiet place so that we can not only praise him with our lips, but also hear his voice. Because God wants to commune with us. God wants us to enter into the Holy of Holies where he can speak to us, where he can show us the direction, where he can minister to us. And so the last piece of furniture in the tabernacle was the, the um, Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark of the Covenant, the top of it was called the Mercy Seat. There were two cherubim facing each other with their wings spread. Um, uh, representing that they guard the very presence of God. But underneath the lid in this chest, this chest that was made of acacia wood was certain, were certain items, the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that budded, along with a pot of manna, representing the fact that God supplies our every need. And, and the presence of God, ladies and gentlemen, the very presence of God exists. God would meet the people. God would meet the high priest. The high priest, he was the only one allowed in the Holy of Holies. He, God would meet him in the Holy of Holies. And the light, the Shekinah glory would fill the place. And the high priest would come out glowing but, but, ladies and gentlemen, if the high priest entered into the Holy of Holies and he had sin in his life, unconfessed sin, he had done wrong and did not repent of a sin, had not consecrated himself, sanctified himself, he died. He died. God killed him in the Holy of Holies. That's why they had a chain on the high priest. They had a chain on one of his ankles so that if the priest out in the holy place there was no movement. There was no movement. And, and they, they, they knew that everything was still in there and the priest was not moving. They would pull the chain out. They were not allowed to go in themselves. They started pulling on that chain and they would drag the high priest out of the Holy of Holies. So it's an amazing, it's an amazing uh, uh, replica of what heaven is like. And God has given us heaven on earth. 
we our bodies represent the tabernacle our bodies we enter in our uh, faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of god we can enter into his presence by hearing we can enter into his presence open our mouths and rejoicing call unto me god says i will answer you i'll show you great and mighty things jesus said come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden i will give you rest so he bids us to come jesus said behold i stand at the door and knock every house every person's body should be a tabernacle of god jesus said i stand at the door and knock if anybody no matter who you are if you hear my voice jesus says and open the door i will come in and live with you and you with me so this tabernacle is so very very important and each piece of furniture represents something each piece of furniture represents something very significant praise god and so we're going to listen in a few minutes to dr mark verkler as he reviews the tabernacle with us and then he will give us much more uh it's a wonderful teaching and it's um so very important to us in our worship of the lord okay so we have a fine tuning dial we can fine tune our tabernacle experience with the lord first of all we enter into his gates with a sincere heart the scripture says if i regard iniquity in my heart he will not hear me so if i'm approaching god and i want him to bless me or i'm praying for somebody and i've got the wrong attitude I've got to stop right there and say, Lord, I confess a bad attitude. Lord, I confess anger at so-and-so or anger, bitterness, even anger. And, 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 and there are times we need to just confess, God, I've been angry with you and I've been harboring bitterness towards you. Repent. Just repent. Repent. Ladies and gentlemen, do not let that spirit of pride prevent you from getting all that God has for you. Because all of our prayers, all of our efforts, we've got churches packed with people every Sunday. Many are going through their own efforts of what they call worship. And they go in with bitterness in their heart. They leave with bitterness in their heart. Some enter into church sick. They leave sick. Some enter in with the wrong attitude. They leave with the wrong attitude. Ladies and gentlemen, God wants a serious worshiper who is willing to seriously uh, approach God and let God do what God does and so this course is teaching us some very serious things that many in the church are not getting and it's going to be up to you to teach a lot of people uh, what you've learned in this course so we need to have a sincere heart God won't hear me if I'm angry with Jackie God won't hear Jackie if she's angry with me uh, God won't hear me if I'm angry with, with cats or cats is angry with me or Roy Rosser has bitterness in his heart towards me. And hey, Roy, God won't hear me, man, if, if, if I don't like white people or you don't like black people or, or uh, you don't like Mexicans. God won't hear you, man, uh, if, if I don't like Italians or I don't like Africans. I can be the pastor of the church. I can be the pastor of a mega church, 50,000 people. But if I got bitterness in my heart, if I've got hatred, if I've got racism in my heart, I'm just going through the motions. I'm just a sham. And, and God, we might be fooling the people, but God knows. That is why we must, we must repent of our sins. We cannot enter into God's presence with any bitterness, any jealousy, any envy. Don't envy certain ministers or ministries because uh, of what they're doing. So many people envy uh, uh, Pastor Paul Begley. There are people jealous, <clears throat> jealous of Pastor Paul Begley, jealous of his anointing. Don't be jealous. God's got a greater anointing for you. <clears throat> if you humble yourself, Pastor Paul's been doing this for years. He's paid his dues. He's paid a price to get into the presence of God and for God to entrust him with this kind of ministry. But if you're jealous or you're bitter or you're bitter at sister so-and-so or you're jealous because she got a new car and she got a, 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 
be uh, uh, her own business and she's prospering and you've been laboring and and you don't you're not prospering don't be bitter just bless god praise god for her prosperity and thank god so we need to have a sincere heart in addition to a sincere heart we need to have a full assurance of faith ladies and gentlemen when i enter into god's presence i'm entering with the full assurance of faith that as i pray he hears me i've got faith in your word lord and you might want to tell god i trust in your word i have faith in your word and and i've got faith that i'm going to wait until my change comes it might not come right away, but God, I know you've got your timing about this and your word says, and my trust is in your word. And I trust you, Lord Jesus, and I renounce the things of this world and I cast down all vain imaginations. Lord, I give my heart to you. I've got the full assurance of faith in you and what your word says, Lord Jesus. And when you take that approach, ladies and gentlemen, you're in, you're going to get your blessings. Then we need to have an inner heart sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Ladies and gentlemen, as you get closer to God, draw nearer to God, Satan's going to bring up stuff that you did when you were 17 years old uh, or you did when you were 20. Uh, 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 he, he loves to remind people, yeah, you had an abortion, you killed a baby. Or, yeah, uh, you, you robbed Farmer Jones and, 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 and stole his tractor. Yeah, you you killed uh, 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 Billy Bob's mule and Satan would try to bring stuff up against you to try to get you into condemnation. Satan is a specialist. As you're getting closer to God, he's digging up dirt. He's digging up stuff that has been long placed under the blood. And so you've got to remember what jesus said and remind yourself of who you are if any person is in christ he or she is a new creation old things are passed away behold all things are become new now if you know in your heart you've got secret sins hidden sins then confess those sins oh god i confess what i did i confess this and once you confess it ladies and gentlemen it's gone it is gone God has removed that as far as the east is from the west. Satan has a record. Your family might have a record. Your family might rem remind you what a rascal you used to be. But you could tell them, oh, no, 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 that isn't even me. You, you could say, hey, hey that wasn't e that's not even me. I'm a new creation in Christ because the word of God says, therefore, if any person is in Christ, he or she's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So you don't have to accept any spirit of condemnation that Satan puts on you. That is why when you confess your sins and be quick to confess your sins. If you sin tonight, hoping you don't, hoping I don't. But if you do, confess your sins quickly because Satan, the first thing he wants to do when you sin, he's going to run up to the throne of God and accuse you. But the, the, the book of Jude tells us that, that when we confess our sins and acknowledge our sins, the Lord Jesus Christ stands up on the throne of God and says, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. That is why it is so important to have a clean heart. Hallelujah. God has given us a plan. He's given us a, 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 a blueprint. He's given us uh, an outline, a way that we in which we can abide in his presence. We can enter into his presence without condemnation. The scripture says, there. therefore, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And so we have our inner heart sprinkled clean from an evil conscience we have our bodies washed with the pure water of the word and so uh in your journaling in your journaling in your exercise after you listen uh to mark verkler and listen to this video begin practicing stand before each piece of the tabernacle furniture and invite jesus to stand beside you Ask him to speak to you about your experience of this piece of furniture in your life. Ask Jesus to speak to you about standing 
before the altar. Ask Jesus to speak to you about standing before the laborer. Ask him to speak to you about standing before the table of showbread and the seven candlesticks. And ask Jesus to speak to you about standing before the altar of incense. And then, and then, uh, when you enter into the Holy of Holies, and as you pray, ladies and gentlemen, you'll hear the Lord say, I'm waiting for you, or you may come in. A lot of times when I'm praying, I say, Lord, may I enter into the Holy of Holies? I want to commune with, I want to commune with you. And I hear God's voice say, come in. I'm waiting for you. I've been waiting for you. You have my permission. Come in. And when you enter into his presence, quiet yourself down. Just quiet yourself down. Don't be afraid. Just quiet yourself down. Because God is waiting for you to enter into his presence. He made you and made me to worship him and fellowship with him. He has things he wants to speak to us. And that is where, when you learn how to enter into his presence, ladies and gentlemen, joy, unspeakable joy. God will show you the plans he has for you. He might speak to you. I know the plans I have for you. Or he might be saying, hey, Ted Rowe, you're doing a great job. And this is what I want you to do next. Or he might say, uh, uh, Patricia Hoffman, you're doing a wonderful job. And you're learning how to enter into my presence. Now, here's what I want you to start doing. And ladies and gentlemen, just rest. Just just, uh, just let the, the Holy Spirit just rise up in you. And just lose yourself in the presence of God. Don't be afraid. Just lose yourself. I mean, what a place to lose yourself. In the Holy of Holies. In the presence of God. In the one who made you. The one who's calling you into his presence. So he can speak spiritual things. Beautiful things. Holy things to you. Well, praise God. Uh, that's my presentation for tonight. And we we want... To give you a, a little time. Hey, how about taking a five-minute break? And then after the five-minute break, we'll come back and listen, listen to Dr. Verkler on the tape. And um, we'll close out. So before we take the five-minute break, is there anyone who has a question? Okay, then let's do what they do on the movies, in the war movies. Let's synchronize our watches. I've got 7.58 p.m. How about let's get back together at three minutes after eight. Three minutes after eight. That'll give us time to listen to Dr. Verkler. We'll be out of here before nine o'clock. Okay, everybody, it's break time until 8.03. For those of you who are still uh, listening to the video, the audio, you take a break too and come back in about four and a half minutes.
back in two minutes. Two minutes. We're on break time at the Communion with God class. We'll be back. We'll return in two minutes. We'll return in one minute, one minute. Okay, okay, let's get ready to resume our class. Let's get ready to resume. Okay, let's see. Patricia, are you back? Roy Rosser, are you back? Thanks, Patricia. Shelly, you ready? Thanks, Roy. Yes, Shelly's back. Okay, thank you. Okay, everybody, let's resume. Let's um, continue with our class tonight. Uh, the remaining portion of the class will be uh, listening to the video, I love Dr. Mark Verkler's videos, his, his audios. So we're going to resume by listening to uh, Dr. Verkler. And then after he's finished, we'll conclude and call it a night. You all are wonderful. We love you. Um, and uh, if you get a chance later on tonight when we finish, wish Jackie a happy birthday. She's celebrating her oh. birthday. Praise God. Yeah. Amen. Praise mm -hmm. God. Okay. Hey, we love you. Okay. Let's get ready for Dr. Verkler. <laughs> Learn to recognize the voice of your Heavenly Father and come to know Him as your dearest friend. He wants to give you wisdom, understanding, and revelation for every area of your life. Father, we just thank you for the wonderful presence of your Holy Spirit that fills this place, that fills our hearts, that fills our minds. And Holy Spirit, we choose to open our hearts and our spirits and our minds to you. 
We ask that you would grant us revelation, knowledge, understanding, illumination, perception, conviction, and empowerment to, to do all that God would have us to do. And for what you do in our lives, we give you all praise and honor and glory. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, there's four keys to hearing God's voice. The first one is, be still. Second one is, vision. Third one is, spontaneity. Fourth one is, journaling. How many of those four keys would we like you to use if you want to hear God's voice? All four. If you use all four at one, one time, what do we promise will happen? You will hear God's voice. Is it a money-back guarantee? Who gives you the money back? John or not. Amen. So we've learned a lot. All right. So that's really good. All right. If you can't get it back from him, come check with us. We'll give it back to you too. Either way will work. We're up to key number three, uh, page 19 in your seminar guides. How to hear God's voice seminar guide. Key number three is looking for vision as you pray. We're going to spend probably two hours on vision. Looking for vision as you pray. I've said that the key that unlocks the door to the inner world is dream, vision, and imagination. And when you say something is the key, you're saying it's very important. So people say, are you sure that vision is that important? So we thought we'd give you a list of 383 references on dream and vision. How many think that that's fairly significant? What would we like you to do with those 387 verses? We would like you to memorize them. That's exactly right. Now, if you couldn't memorize them, what could you do? You could read them and you could meditate on them. Pray over them and say, Lord, now here's the prayer that I had. So if you want to put this prayer in the margin, you're welcome to do it. As I prayed through this list of verses, I said, God, show me how you want to use the eyes of my heart. Because I had no idea how he wanted to use them. So my question was, Lord, show me how you want to use the eyes of my heart. And my second question was, Lord, show me how you want me to use the eyes of my heart. First question, Lord, how do you want to use the eyes of my heart? Second question, how do you want me to use the eyes of my heart? I had no idea what the answer was to either question. I prayed through them, and we got a lot of insight, and I'm going to share with you a lot of the things that God shared with me in the next couple hours. On the top of page 19, we've got four key verses that are listed out of that list. Key number one, or the first verse there, he said, Now hear my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision, and I will speak with him in a dream. Are we a prophetic group of people? Yes. Did he say he might give us dream and vision? He said, I will give dream and vision. Now, how about imagination? That's a pretty scary word for some people. But it shows up in the next verse. O oh Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the what? Imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people, and prepare their heart unto thee. So God's not afraid of the word imagination. So if he's not afraid of it, I guess I don't have to be afraid of it either. Amen? He's saying, hide my word in the imagination of your heart. How many of you have hidden in your imagination scenes of the Israelites walking around the walls of Jericho, blowing trumpets, and the walls coming down. If that's hidden in your imagination, say amen. How about the Israelites walking through the Red Sea? Is that hidden in your imagination? Yes. How about Jesus walking on the water? Is that hidden in your imagination? Jesus breaking loaves, feeding 5,000, is it hidden in your imagination? If so, you've done what this verse said. This verse said, take and hide my word in the imagination of your heart so that when you need provision, You've got a picture to draw upon. When I need a wall to fall down, I've got a picture to draw upon. When I need a loaf to multiply and provision to multiply, I've got a picture to draw upon. When I've got a storm I've got to walk across, I've got a picture to draw upon. And a picture is worth what? A thousand words. A picture is a thousand times more powerful than ideas because pictures are the language of the heart and ideas are the language of the mind. And so a picture deepens things about a thousand fold for us. Maybe more than that, all right? But at least that. Next verse, then Jesus answered and said unto him, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do what? Nothing of himself unless it's something he what? Sees the Father doing. For whatever he does, the Son does in like manner. I have a question. How often do you think, according to that verse, that Jesus is using vision? All the time. If you think all the time, would you say amen? I think all the time. How often do you think you and I should see vision? 
all the time. The reason is because Jesus is our example as to how to live. How often do we see vision? I had seen one vision in the first 10 years of my Christian life. How many know that's nothing like Jesus? And the Lord said, Mark, if you want to be like me on the outside, you've got to be like me on the inside. And on the inside, he's seeing pictures all the time. On the inside, I'm thinking thoughts all the time. I'm a Westerner. He's not. You know, some people say, you know, it sounds to me like your teaching has a little bit of Eastern thought in it. I hope it does. Jesus wasn't born in America. He wasn't born in the West. He was born in the Middle East. So if your Christian experience doesn't have some Eastern thought in it, then why not? Did you Westernize it? Did you codify it? Did you demysticize it? Did you make it just a concrete theology? If so, you desecrated it. Because Christianity is more than a concrete theology. It's an encounter with a living God. All right, so I'm not afraid of the East. I'm not afraid of the, I'm not afraid of anything. All right, I just, if it's in the Bible, works for me. And if anybody or nobody doesn't like it, doesn't really make any difference. All right, if every Eastern in the world likes it or none like it, doesn't make any difference. All right, so that kind of thinking doesn't work for me. I'm opposed to it. You know, like like well, I think uh, Easterners do this or New Agers do this. Therefore, I don't. I say I don't care how many eight New Agers do or don't do anything. I do. I don't poll New Agers or Easterners to find out what I believe. I do what the Bible teaches, and if every Easterner and every New Ager in the world wants to do it, that's fine. If none of them want to do it, that's fine. It really doesn't make any difference to me. I do it because it's based in the Bible. Fair enough. So be careful what you read. All right. Don't let people put fear in your heart. And don't let them get your reasoning backwards or sideways up or upside down. And I would consider that upside down reasoning. All right, the next verse. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Sons and daughters shall prophesy. Young men shall see visions. Old men shall dream dreams. Are we in the last days? Has God poured his spirit out? Did he say he might give us dream and vision? He said, I shall give dream and vision. If you and I are not receiving a dream and vision, is it because God is not sending it? No, it's because we're not receiving what God is sending. So I said, God, I repent for not receiving. I repent for not looking. I repent for not asking. And I choose to ask. And that was my initial prayer. All right. We prayed a prayer like that a couple days ago, didn't we? Or didn't we? Did we? If you think we did, say amen. That's six or seven. That's enough. All right. So the rest of you, can get saved anytime. All right, so there we go. I'm not afraid of godly imagination, not afraid of dream, and not afraid of vision. We're going to teach on those things here over the next uh, couple hours. Let's go to um, page 21, top of the page, and uh, talk about Protestantism just for a moment as a, as, a, as a group of people. I think Protestants have a 500-year-old bitter root judgment and inner vow against vision. And I think they got this when they left the Catholic Church, and they did not like all the imagery in the Catholic Church, the different statutes and things, and they said, I think this is a graven image. And one of the Ten Commandments is, thou shalt have no graven images. And so I think the negative judgment that they formed is, all use of imagery constitutes a graven image, therefore it breaks one of the Ten Commandments, therefore my inner vow is, I'm going to reject all use of imagery in my Christian life. Now, one reason I believe that's true is because the Bible says you can look at the fruit in a person's life and trace it back to the fruit, or the root. So let's look at the result. The fruit is many Protestant books on systematic theology don't even have a section on dream or vision or imagination or any other application of the use of the eyes or heart. And this is startling considering the fact that the Bible stories and actions which come as a result of dreams and visions in the Bible equal a section equal to the size of the entire New Testament. One third of the Bible is the stories that come out of dreams and visions. And Protestant theologians, many of them, not all, but many of them, don't even write a section in their theology books on dream and vision. My question is, what gives you the authority to take one third of the Bible dump it in the garbage can and say, I'm not even going to write about it or consider it or honor it in any way. I think the thing that gives them that authority is this ungodly belief. All use of imagery is a graven image, and the inner vow, I'm not going to use imagery, and therefore I'm not. I can ignore it. It's okay. So I think it's good to repent for our own sins and the sins of our forefathers, and um, I didn't use imagery in my Christian life for the first 11 years I was saved. And so I repented. 
for not using imagery, for not honoring imagery. And I said, God, I'd like you to restore the eyes of my heart. And uh, I had to answer a question, which was, what's the difference then between a graven image, which we do know we shouldn't have? Thou shalt have no graven images. We, we know we shouldn't do that. That's a ten, one of the Ten Commandments. What's the difference between that kind of idolatry and the kind of imagery that I'm teaching that we should use? Could we give you some distinctions between the two? And we can. This chart on the bottom of page 21 is some distinctions or differences between idolatry, which is forbidden, and imagery, as I'm suggesting that we use it. First question, first distinction would be, who authorized the image? Under idolatry column, in the Old Testament, you find that when they made the golden calf in Exodus 32, 1, it was man who authorized the image. Man came up with the idea, not God. Under the imagery as I teach it, it's God who comes up with the images he wants us to focus on. In Exodus chapter 25, verses 8 to 22, we find that uh, God is laying out the imagery of the tabernacle. And in the Holy of Holies, where he says you can come in, the high priest can come in once a year and stand or kneel before the Ark of the Covenant, which is a chest, which has a mercy seat on top, which is a lid. And on top of that mercy seat are two uh, cherubims, which are uh, uh, carved in gold, all right? And the tips of their wings are touching, and God would speak from beneath the tips of their wings to Moses face to face and mouth to mouth. And Moses would come in, and he would kneel or stand before this image, and God would speak to him. Now, if God is opposed to all use of imagery in our Christian life, how many of you know he could have left that room empty? He could have had him come in and just stand in an empty room and approach God in an empty room. Could he have done that? He didn't. Yeah, he could have, but he didn't. He put something in there that imaged God and said, you come and kneel before this and it'll help you connect with me. Which says to me, God is not afraid of me using an image as a way to connect with him. Now in the New Testament, he gave us a different image. I don't come and kneel before the Ark of the Covenant anymore. When I come to God now, I fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of, of my faith. So in both Old and New Testament, God has given us an image and commanded us to kneel or stand in front of it and fix our eyes on it and use that image as a way of encountering him. If you see that, would you say amen? So God is not afraid of imagery. Can you say that with me? God is not afraid of imagery and say this, therefore, I'm not afraid of imagery. Amen. And I'm not afraid of imagery, okay? And, and I want us to overcome the fear. As a matter of fact, I'd like to pray a prayer of repentance over this whole fear, this ungodly belief and inner vow that we just talked about. And I'd like to repent for this ungodly belief. Um, and if you'd like to repent with me, I'm going to give you a chance. You can repent for your sins and the sins of your forefathers. Uh, and, and we'll ask God to restore imagery to the Christian, Christian church. So if you want to pray this, say, Dear Jesus, I repent of the ungodly belief that all use of imagery constitutes a graven image. I repent of the inner vow that I would not use imagery as part of my approach to you. I accept the truth of your word that you use imagery. You did it in the Holy of Holies You've asked me to fix my eyes on Jesus. You are not afraid of imagery. You see a value for it. I see a value for it. And I choose to use it as part of my Christian experience from this day on. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a good prayer, all right? Number two, the second point of distinction between idolatry and imagery is what's the goal? In the Old Testament, when they made this golden calf, their goal was to worship the golden calf. Well, that's not my goal. When I paint a scene with you and Jesus walking on the Sea of Galilee, we didn't worship that image. We used that image as a stepping stone into divine flow. What's the action? The action under idolatry is that the image... The idol remained dead. This golden calf didn't come alive and talk to him. It was dead. Well, that's not quite true with us. In the imagery we used uh, today in the last few sessions, what happens is divine flow is prompted. The scene comes alive. Jesus comes alive in the scene because we invite him to. 
we say, Holy Spirit, take over the scene and just show me what you're doing. And the Holy Spirit takes it over. Jesus comes alive and does things which I wasn't describing and you weren't expecting. Now, by show of hands, I want to ask a question. In the last few journaling sessions, as you met with Jesus, how many of you found that the scene did come alive and Jesus did do things which I wasn't describing and you weren't really expecting? If that happened, would you raise your hand? All right. Now, I'm seeing most hands have gone up here. All right. And see, that's what we want. We're just saying that the image that we paint is a stepping stone into divine flow, and what we're after is for divine flow to happen, and you're telling me it did happen, and I'm saying, praise God. That's exactly what we're looking for. Um, the fourth point, what is the prayer? They pray to the golden calf. Well, I don't pray to an image that I paint in my mind, but as divine flow is activated and communion with God is established, then I'm going to start journaling and dialoguing with God uh, through my journaling in that vision that unfolds. What is the purpose under idolatry? They're going to worship the thing. Well, the purpose that I was using imagery this morning when I painted a scene for you was to help us focus our hearts before God so that we could communicate with him. That was the purpose. What was their attitude? Stiff-necked and proud. What was our attitude today? We were humbly seeking the face of God. Totally different attitude. What's the control issue? They were trying to manip manipulate God, make him do what they wanted. We weren't. We were saying, God, we just want to see you in action. What are you doing? We want to connect with you, capture your movements, and take them on in our own lives. So those are seven points of distinction between the, the wrong and the right way of using imagery. If that helps, would you say amen? Amen. Why am I willing to fight for this? I'm going to give you a few of the points just off the top of my head, even though we don't have them here. But on our website, you can find 14 reasons why I'm willing to lay down my life for this whole thing of imagery. You know, it seems like God will ask everyone to lay their life down for something, all right? And, uh, and he'll tell you what it is. And for me, I'm willing to fight for the use of imagery in our Christian experience. Because with, if I can't see, it, it removes the heart of Christianity, a lot of the heart of Christianity out. For example, if I want faith, I need to be able to see. When God made Abraham the father of faith and said, look what I did here, First, God gave him a word. He said, come on over from Ur of Chaldees. I'm going to bless you and, and bless the world through your seed. And then he gave him a picture. He said, see the stars of the heaven? You're going to have that many children. The next verse says, then Abram believed. I'm quoting Genesis chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. In verse 5, he gives him a vision. The next verse says, then he believed. So belief is a result of what? A vision that's been given to you by God. So if you want heart faith to change your world, what do you need from God? You need two things. The first thing is an idea from God, and the second thing is a picture from God. And if I don't have those two things, I probably cannot release heart faith like Abraham did. I want to release heart faith. I want to change my world. I want to be a fa uh, just like the father of faith, a mighty man of faith. I need a picture. What's the world going to look like when, when my life is done impacting it? When we've been able to teach the world how to hear communion with God, what will it look like? If I can see that, that picture, I'm drawn into what I see. Here's what the Lord told in my journey one day. He said, Mark, whatever you fix your eyes on grows within you. Whatever grows within you, you become. You know, now there's a journal entry that for me was worth a million dollars because I used to fix my eyes on my sin and my sin grew within me and I became sinful. I used to fix my eyes on my weakness. My weakness grew within me. I became weak. He said, Mark, whatever you fix your eyes on grows within you. Whatever grows within you, you become. So where are we supposed to fix our eyes? On Jesus. And, we, and Jesus grows within us, and we become Christ-like. So the only place you're supposed to be looking is at Jesus. As you look at him, you reflect him. And that's the way the Bible says we're transformed. It says this in 2 Corinthians 3.18 and 4.18. We're transformed while we look. Not at things which are seen, but things which are not seen. So I look in the spirit realm and I say, God, show me how you're handling this. I know I'm, I'm handling it. I'm mad as can be. So, Lord, what are you doing? And he's there, he's there laughing. I said, what's so funny? He said, Mark, let me show you the, the humor in this. And he shows me the humor. I said, that is pretty funny, isn't it? I'm transformed because I looked, saw his response, took it on, and it changed me. Do you see that? Say amen. That's the only way I know to be transformed that works. I used to try gritting my teeth, putting my muscles up, and say, oh, I will be different. Well, that's will worship. That's religion. This kind of transformation is Christianity. I look at Jesus. I reflect him. I'm transformed. Into him. So if I don't, can't use imagery, 
I can't be transformed into Christ likeness unless I use will worship, which is not an acceptable uh, part of Christian experience. So use of vision gives me faith, gives me the power to be transformed, gives me the power to meditate in the word. We already re looked at the word meditation. It says when we meditate in the Bible, it says part of meditation is to imagine the scene. If I cannot use my imagination, then I cannot properly meditate on the word of God, which means I cannot obey the 20 commands which say meditate on my word, and I cannot receive revelation knowledge. Do you think I'm willing to miss that? Man, I'm not willing to miss that. So I've got to have imagination as part of my Christian experience. The whole Lord's Supper where I receive divine grace. He said, this is my body. This is my bread. That's a picture. There's use of imagery there. All right? And, and it's, it's part of receiving grace in, in the Lord's Supper. I'm going to miss a part of that if I, if I can't use imagery and can't accept the imagery that's right there that the Lord ordained for me. Dreams and visions. At night, God says, I speak to you through dreams and visions. He says, I give you counsel at night. I'm going to miss all of that. If I can't use imagery in my Christian experience, I'll miss that. When they made the tabernacle in the Old Testament, God gave divine creativity to the people who made the tabernacle. And, uh, and, and he showed them the pictures. He showed Moses the pictures. He showed them the pattern. And, and he, he anointed their hands, the craftsmen. Well, that whole ability to, to, to see and to create, I'm going to lose that. See, no one creates anything without first seeing. If a woman, a woman wants to uh, redo her living room, you know, create something new, she gets an idea. Then she gets a picture of what it should look like. And then she gets her husband to help move the furniture all around and help fix the whole thing. All right? But you see, it's uh, imagery. If without that picture, she wouldn't have known what the living room was supposed to look like. No one creates anything without first seeing it. That's why if you're going to have a building church, a church building program, you don't just tell people, you know, we need some money for a building. You put a picture of the building up on either on a podium so they can all see it or on the wall because that picture will galvanize faith and draw people into it. So if the church is afraid of picturing an imagery and the New Agers are not afraid of picturing an imagery, guess who becomes the creative cutting edge in the next generation? Who? The New Agers. And whose fault would that be? Mine, ours, because I was afraid to use imagery. So I'm not afraid to use imagery. I don't like books that are negative about imagery because they just help perpetrate this 500-year-old curse that we've been under as a Protestant church that I shouldn't use imagery. So I reject all those books. I don't have any in my, in my library at all. I would recommend that you do the same thing because we need to restore dream and vision to our lives and godly use of imagination. All right, so that's some of the reasons I'm willing to fight for imagery because I don't want to lose all those things in my Christian experience. Let's go to page uh, 32, 22, page 22, defining different uh, kinds of vision. One kind of vision is a spontaneous vision on the screen inside your mind. You're just driving on the road in your car. A person's face flashes across your mind's eye. You know you're supposed to pray for that person. If you've had that kind of a image or vision or picture, would you say amen? All right, that's very, very common. That is one kind of a vision that God can give to you. Spontaneous picture, lights on your mind. Number two, a spontaneous picture, lights on your mind, but you're in prayer. If you want to put a verse there, number two, put down Psalms 23, verses 1 to 6. Psalms 23, verses 1 to 6 is a use of imagery in prayer, which we've already quoted it earlier. Okay? So um, I'm in prayer. I'm saying, God, show me what you want to show me. And a picture lights my mind while I'm in prayer. If you've had that kind of a visionary encounter, would you say Amen. Amen. Very common. Number three, seeing a vision outside of yourself. If you'd like a scriptural verse, it's 2 Kings 6.17. 2 Kings 6.17, seeing a vision outside of your head. All right. Elisha's servant goes outside one morning, opens the door, looks outside, and he sees enemy chariots <laughs> surrounding the house. He said, this is going to be a depressing day in the ministry. And uh, he went back to bed, something like that. And the Lord said, and Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes so he can see what's going on out there. The Lord opens his eyes, and what does he see next time he looks outside? Tell me if you know. Chariots of fire between him and the enemy chariots. If you think that improves your perspective considerably on the day, say amen. Yeah. You see, he's no longer full of fear. He's full of faith like we can handle the day. Today is going to be a great day in God. Hallelujah. Did anything out there actually change? What changed? 
his perspective. He saw in the spirit realm what was really happening, and he went from fear to faith. Hallelujah. Because God does that in my German and your German every single day. He shows you what really is going on out there, and you move from fear to faith. You move from negative to positive, and you become a world changer because you know God's in control because he showed you how he is. He showed you what he's doing, and you said, yes. And without God showing me, I just look. I see fate out there. I see, wow, powerful evil. God said, excuse me. There's some huge angels here too. All right, so if you're using vision as part of your prayer time, God will show you this. For me, I went from negative to positive. I went from a big fear of the Antichrist to zero fear of the Antichrist and a great big faith in the living Christ who's going to disciple the world through his church, which is us. Hallelujah. And I'm a whole lot more happier with this new view I have of us discipling of the world. My old view was me hiding in a cave, waiting for the rapture and hoping Satan didn't you know, wolf me down before I got stuck out for the rapture. That wasn't really an overcoming worldview. That was kind of, you know, hiding kind of a thing, you know. And how in the world can I disciple the nation when I'm hiding in the cave hoping for the rapture? And the Lord just kind of changed all of that. He said, Mark, get out there and change society. I said, how? He said, saturate the world with the message of the kingdom of God. I said, okay. That's what I'm doing. I'm out there changing. We build a university. Several thousand students hoping for a million students, believing for a million students. Change the world. Go ahead and make a difference. Don't whine, don't cower, don't hide, don't prophesy gloom and doom. Stop all that and go ahead and believe that you can disciple the nations and become a part of doing that. Amen? And if you journal for a year, you'll, you'll, you'll become all of that. All the negativity will go and it will all turn into positive. Hallelujah. All right. Number four. Well, number three. How many of you actually seen a vision outside of your own head like Elisha? Elisha's servants. You actually, like out there, you've seen an angel, you've seen a demon, you've seen the wind of the Holy Spirit or a dove, or, or you've seen something out there, if you, outside of your head. If you've seen that, would you say amen? All right, very common kind of a vision also. Number four, vision while well in a trance. If you want to put a scripture verse down, put Acts 10, 10 to 23. Acts 10, 10 to 23. Peter is uh, ready to have lunch. And the Lord puts him in a trance, knocks him out cold. That's like when you're slain in the spirit, you're laying on the floor, you're, not, you're knocked out cold. That's like a trance. It's deep sleep. Okay? God puts him into a trance, and he lowers what down from heaven? Tell me. A white sheet. What is on the white sheet? Animals. What kind of animals? Unclean animals. What does he tell them to do with the unclean animals? Eat them. Is this a literal or a symbolic vision? Symbolic. What's he actually telling him to do? Eat the Gentiles, yes. <laughs> Did you say eat? No. Receive the Gentiles. Receive the Gentiles. All right. So be careful about combining literal and symbolic in the same thing. You'll get all messed up. All right? Now, does this particular vision give you and I permission to eat unclean animals, or isn't it talking about that? It's not talking about that. It's talking about letting the Gentiles into the church. So if I want to eat unclean animals, I can't get permission from this verse. I'd have to go find some other verse that perhaps might give you permission, but this one won't. How many have had a trance-like vision? God knocked you out cold on the floor, and in a trance, you received a vision. If you've had that happen, would you please raise your hand? I'd like to see how many hands go up. Good and high, please. Wave them around a little bit. Okay. Well, that's great. Thank you. I saw about 30, 35 hands there in this group of four or 500 people, so about 10%. That's a lot, all right? But we're in Toronto, so what would you expect, all right? This is where the right brainers gather, okay? So a lot of wild, woolly, weird things happen here, all right? More than in the norm, because we collect all these interesting people here, and we let them have parties, praise God, okay? Now, what I do want you to know that having a trance is perfectly legal, biblically speaking, and uh, having a vision in a trance is, fine, is fully acceptable. All right, number five. A visionary encounter through experience in a dream, Acts 16, 9 and 10. If you want to write that down, Acts 16, 9 and 10. Paul is on a missionary journey. He's wondering where to go on his missionary journey. He's been forbidden by the Spirit to go to Bithynia, forbidden by the Spirit to go to Asia. He goes to sleep at night, and he has a dream of a Macedonian man motioning to come over to Macedonia. He wakes up and decides he's supposed to go to Macedonia. If you've had a dream that you felt God was giving you a message in a dream, would you say Amen. Amen. Dreams are very common. There's about 50 dreams in the Bible. As I said, about one-third of the Bible comes from dreams. And uh, dreams are a way that God speaks to us. And if you want, we could take a few minutes and digress and talk about dream interpretation. Would you like to do that? 
All right, page 23. You should have a free column on page 23 since you all screamed yes. So obediently, I'm going to teach you this, all right? All right, thank you. Page 23, you got a free column. Put notes on dream interpretation there, if you would. Notes on dream interpretation. And the first thing we're going to do is going to be principles of dream interpretation. That'll be the first section of this column. Let me give you five principles for interpreting dreams. This is a very, very brief introduction to dreams. If you want more, you can go to our website. We have 20 pages free of charge. You can download from the free book section 20 pages of principles of dream interpretation. Principle number one, okay? Principles of dream interpretation number one. Most dreams are symbolic. Most dreams are symbolic. We'll say maybe 95% of the average person's dreams are symbolic. If you're extremely right brain, that may be a little bit different from you. That may not be quite so high. But for most of us, we're going to say this is symbolic. In the Bible, you look at the dreams in the Bible. You got wheels inside of wheels spinning. That's symbolism. You got ten-headed monsters. That's symbolism. You got trees being chopped off, things growing out of, out of them. That's symbolism. You got seven fat cows, seven skinny cows. That's all symbolism. In the Bible, most dreams are symbolic. So when you and I approach our dream, we're going to assume it's probably symbolic. Okay. Same as if you look at a political, political cartoon in the newspaper. You assume that it's symbolic, and it will probably be that symbolic 20, 95% of the time. Number two, the symbols come out of the dreamer's life. The symbols come out of the dreamer's life. So uh, if you're the dreamer, the symbols come from your life. If I'm the dreamer, they come from my life. That means I don't want to go to a dream dictionary book to find out what the symbol means. I want to ask you in your heart, what does that symbol mean to you? How about some biblical examples? Joseph, he's a shepherd boy. He lives out under the open sky. And what kind of symbols show up in his dreams? He sees, um, he sees stars, suddenly the stars bowing down. He sees sheaves bowing down. These are the things that surround his life. The symbols come from your life. Okay, the sheaves bowing down symbolized what? Tell me if you know. His brothers and father and mother bowing down. The sun and moon symbolized what? Dad and mom. Stars symbolized brothers. Does that mean every time I dream about the sun and moon, I'm dreaming about dad and mom? Does it mean I could be dreaming about dad and mom? Yeah, that's the way symbolism works, all right? Um, when Pharaoh dreams, he doesn't live out in the open field. He lives in a palace, all right? So he doesn't dream of sun, moon, and stars. He dreams of a statue of gold, <laughs> All right, little stone hits the statue, the statue crumbles, little stone grows into mount. What surrounds kings who live in palaces? Statues of gold made out of themselves normally. All right, so um, the symbols come from your surrounding. So let's say that uh, just before you went to sleep at night, you watched some television, which I know you wouldn't do because you're saved, but just in case you backslid, all right? And now you go to sleep and you've got undigested TV characters showing up in your dreams. So the question is, is this undigested television, or are these recent symbols that mean something to you that are being woven into a story for you? Number one or number two? Number two is the right answer. These are recent symbols that mean something to you that are being woven into a story for you. How many of you have played Pictionary or Bible Pictionary? If you have, say amen. All right, that's where you draw little pictures and try to get people to say words. Your, dream, your heart is doing that at night. It's drawing little pictures and dreams trying to get you to say a series of words. God says, I counsel you at night through your dreams, so if I can learn to hear from God through my dreams, I can get divine counsel all night as well as all day, all right, which is very, very exciting. It's Psalm 1618 or 1816, I believe, that says God counsels us at night through our dreams. Okay, so here we are, number two, um, the symbols come out of the dreamer's life. And that means I'm not going to a dream dictionary book to interpret it. I'm going to say, what does that symbol mean to my heart? And I'm going to ask that question. I'm going to say, Holy Spirit, what does that symbol mean to my heart? And then I'm going to tune to flow, and I'm going to journal out what comes back. Because my heart speaks through flow, so I'm going to tune to flow and journal, and it's going to pop right in just like that. And so that's the way you're going to, you're going to journal the interpretation of your dreams out using flow and vision. Number three, the dream generally speaks of concerns which your heart is facing. The dream generally speaks of concerns which your heart is facing. If you think of Paul, he's on his missionary journey. He's been forbidden by the Spirit to go to Bithynia, forbidden by the Spirit to go to Asia. He goes to bed at night with this question on his heart. Where should I be going on my missionary trip? 
That night he has a dream of a Macedonian man, Moshni. Knowing the question on Paul's heart, who can interpret that? If that's real easy to interpret, say amen. See, as soon as you know the question, the dream makes a lot of sense. The dream is saying, come on over here. He got up in the morning and went to Macedonia. If you read the 50 dreams of the Bible, they got up and acted on their dreams over and over every time, which is so amazing. I, I never acted on my dreams. They got up and acted on their dreams because they knew it was God talking to them, and they responded to him. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, uh, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar, he went to sleep one night with this in his heart. He said, I am the greatest king who has ever lived. My kingdom's going to go on as an everlasting kingdom to all generations. And that night, he has a dream of a tree being chopped off at the roots. <laughs> Knowing what's on his heart, who can interpret that? You arrogant fool, you're not going on forever. I'm going to cut you down. All right, so um, you always start your dream interpretation by asking, what was the question on my heart? What were the issues on my heart yesterday when I went to bed? Because the dream, most likely, 95% of the time or so, is going to be talking about those issues and giving you answers to those issues. Number four, the dreamer's heart will leap when it hears the right interpretation. The dreamer's heart will leap when it hears the right interpretation. So if I'm helping you with your dream, and I say, you know, this symbol could mean this, and this symbol could mean this, and this symbol could mean this. And, and you're listening and you say, well, yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Is that the right interpretation to your dream? No, why not? Heart didn't leap. Your mind gave mental assent, but the dream didn't come from your mind. The dream came from your heart. You do not accept any interpretation to your dream that your heart does not leap to and say, bingo, aha, yes. It's called the aha moment. And if you don't have the aha moment, A-H-A, write it in there, aha, all right? If you don't have that aha, then you don't accept the interpretation. Never accept any interpretation that your heart does not leap to if it's your dream. Never, ever push an interpretation on anybody, all right? Because that's called authoritarianism, domination, manipulation, control, and don't ever do that. And if you do it, don't tell me that you've done it because I'll probably have to beat you up in Christian love. All right? So don't do that. It's a very nasty thing to do. All right. Number five, never make a major decision based only on a dream. I would recommend that you never make a major decision based only on a dream without getting some other confirmation through other ways that God talks to us. I would not make a major decision based only on a dream without getting some other confirmation through other ways that God speaks to me. Because God speaks to us a lot of different ways, and um, he'll, he's glad to confirm it. Moses didn't go to Macedonia just because of a dream. He'd also, at the same time, been forbidden by the Spirit to go to Bithynia, forbidden to go to Asia, so that was confirmation. He'd also been sent out by the laying in the hands in Presbytery, that's confirmation. He also had an effective ministry setting up churches. That's confirmation. Test things by their fruit. I'm good as an evangelist. So he had three, had three or four other voices saying, you're on the right path. Keep moving in this direction. So I would like a few other voices from God to confirm the dream if it's a major decision. Okay. Now with those principles, you can now interpret dreams. Isn't that exciting? That didn't take long at all. You want to work on a dream of mine just to see how well you do? Practicum workshop. Two people said yes. That's enough for me. Okay. So here we go. <clears throat> The rest of you were still writing, right? All right, I had this dream uh, back in 1979. It was actually right at the same time I was learning how to hear God's voice. It was this one day I'd learned how to hear God's voice. I'd learned how to use vision, learned how to journal. I was pretty excited. I actually took my notebook, set it down next to my bed that night, and said, God, would you want to speak to me through dreams? Now, I had not recalled the dream for nine months, but that simple act of putting my journal there, asking God to speak, I recalled three dreams in the first night. And you'll find the same thing. If you put a notebook next to your bed, ask God to give to you dreams, you'll get dreams every week. All right? So um, first dream, I have a new job. I have, I'm the caretaker of a house. I'm going, uh, going up the stairs, into the bathroom, getting cleaning supplies out, coming back down the stairs, I'm riding a horse. <laughs> now, if you've never ridden a horse up the stairs and turned around the bathroom, brought it back down, you have no idea how difficult this is. How many vote for a pizza dream here? How many vote for God speaking here? Okay. How many don't want to vote till we interpret it? <laughs> Clever. All right. One way to interpret a dream is you can start with the first symbol and ask, what does that mean? Go to the next one. What does that mean? Just work your way through it. Let's try that approach. 
All right, first symbol is I have a new job. Give me some ideas as to what that could symbolize. Change. New ministry. My quest to hear God. How about this new job of journaling? I mean, I had it the night after I got it, the new job of journaling. You know, I tried journaling for the first time, and that night, that night my dream says, you got a new job today, didn't you? The new job was using vision, using journaling, using spontaneity. How comfortable does my dream indicate I feel about this new job? I feel like a bull in the china closet. I feel like a horse on the stairwell. I said, God, I'm a theologian. I'm a left brain thinker. I said, this whole flow thing and vision, man, this is really, I feel very awkward about this. I feel like a horse on the stairs. All right, well, yeah, so I feel awkward, but if I stick with it, I'm going to go up a flight of stairs. What might that symbolize? Higher place. How many think journeying and hearing God's voice could take me to a higher place in God? When we get there, we're going to get some cleaning supplies out. What might that symbolize? <laughs> God's going to clean up some areas of my life. How many think there's a very good likelihood that God might do that? He said, Mark, don't be so judgmental. Mark, love your wife. All right, that's cleaning supplies, straightening out some attitudes in my heart. All right. So, question, is this a dream from God? Is it an encouraging dream? Yes, saying, I know you feel awkward about the path you're on. Stick with it. It's going to take you to a higher place than me. Now, second dream I have that night, I uh, pull my car into a parking lot. I turn it off, and it will not turn off. It continues to backfire. All right. What's that about? Any ideas? What's going on? All right, I'm hearing several answers. The one I heard right here was great. Your mind is racing and you're trying to shut it off, and it's saying, you're not turning me off. See, that was the left side of my brain, which I, which was racing, and I was saying, now we're going to shut you off so we can go to intuition and flow. He says, you're not turning me off. I have ruled your life for the last 20, 25 years. There's no way you're turning me off. It shows the mammoth god of rationalism that was in my life that said, no, I'm not shutting down here, okay? So um, I said, yes, you are, and it's learned to, to give place to the Holy Spirit. All right. Now, how do you recall dreams? If you've still got room on that column, just put another section there, how to recall dreams. How to recall dreams. Now, I'll give you five things you can do to recall a dream. Number one, you say to yourself, I believe dreams contain a valid message. Let's say it together. I believe dreams contain a valid message. Because the Bible says that. God says, I give dreams and I give visions. He said in Acts 2.17, I will give dreams, I will give visions. I will counsel you at night through your dreams. So that was the opposite to what I was saying, because I used to be saying, I believe dreams are leftover on digestive pizza, and I scorn them, disdain them, ignore them, and hope they go away. Well, my heart says, fine, if you're going to scorn me, not honor me, I'm not going to give you the revelation that I have available for you every night. So my heart didn't wake me up, all right? Because your heart needs to wake you up within five minutes of the dream ending, or you will not recall the dream. And if your heart knows you don't want to hear it because you're going to scorn it, it won't wake you up. So it doesn't, so you miss it. Number two, ask God to speak to you through dreams. As you fall asleep at night, a simple one-line prayer, Lord, please give me a dream tonight. Ask God to speak to you through dreams. And for me, it's just a one-liner. Lord, please give me a dream tonight. Ask God to speak to you through dreams. Number three, put your journal next to your bed. Put a notebook, put some paper next to your bed. And that's a signal to your heart saying, hey, if you'll wake me up, I'll, I'll write down what you give me. And your heart says, you know what? If you're going to honor me and take me seriously, I will wake you up. Now, when your heart wakes you up, don't just turn the light on and blind your spouse because that promotes a divorce, all right? Go to the next room over and do your journey the next room over, all right? Or get on your computer, whatever works for you, all right? I do almost all my stuff on computer if there's one nearby. Number four, get eight hours of sleep. <laughs> now, that's fun. You say, I can't get eight hours of sleep. Sure you can, all right? Get eight hours of sleep. Um... You may have to resign as general superintendent of the universe, but once you've done that, you can get eight hours of sleep because God gives to his beloved even in their sleep. 
So if you're honoring God, he can give to you even while you're asleep. The reason you want eight hours of sleep is because that whole last hour is light sleep called alpha sleep, which is where you have dream periods. You have dream periods in alpha level. And um, when you go to sleep initially, you go way down to delta, theta and delta. Then you come back up after 90 minutes into alpha and have a five-minute dream period. You go back down to deep sleep, you come back up and have 90 minutes later, have a 10-minute dream period. Go back down, come back up, then you have a 20-minute dream period. It keeps getting longer each night, okay? So if you sleep eight hours, you're going to get a whole, the whole last hour will be alpha, will be a lot of dream time. And number five, awaken naturally without the use of an alarm clock. Awaken naturally without the use of the alarm clock. Because alarm clocks shatter dream recall, blasting tidbits of dreams into oblivion where you never find them again. All right? So don't do that. I mean, Joseph didn't have an alarm clock. He just woke up naturally. Now, you can say to yourself, self, wake up at 6 o'clock, and how many know you will wake up at 1 minute to 6? It's very amazing because you have an inner alarm clock. So do that or do your dream periods in the weekends when you can sleep in or take a nap in the afternoon. That's all going to be alpha period. You can have a nice dream cycle right there also. Okay, um, how about a few other issues, a few more things about dreams? If your dream repeats itself and you have it more than one night in a row, why do you think anyone repeats themselves? <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't get the message the first time, all right? So you didn't respond to the dream, so the dream comes back and says, I'm still down here, I'm still communicating, you didn't respond. Now if you just keep not responding, then the dream gets more and more intense and it may get fearful, turn into a nightmare. Because the trauma and the need in your heart is growing bigger and bigger and you're not responding, so it may turn into a nightmare. All right? So a reoccurring nightmare would show a, a, an unhealed wound, wound in your heart that probably needs prayer ministry. I had a reoccurring nightmare for oh, 10, 15 years of my life. I picked it up when I was a kid. Um, one of my grandparents died, and my impression and understanding at that age was that he'd had a stroke. All right? I'm not sure that was quite accurate, but that's the way I saw it at that age. And I picked up fear of stroke. All right? And I didn't even know what a stroke was. I remember going into the nurse's office in high school saying, I got chest pains. I thought a stroke was down here. It's actually in your head, all right? She just threw me out and said, no, you don't have chest pains. Get out of here, okay? But uh, I remember having a dream five days a week for about 10, 15 years. I would wake up, and I would feel paralyzed, like I'd had a stroke. My arms were paralyzed. My tongue, my, my tongue was enlarged. My head was enlarged. I couldn't move. I checked the whole thing off, and I'd be fine. And I kind of assume that's the way people wake up, but I guess that's not the way you all wake up, amen? But when you do it five days a week, you assume it's natural. Well, when our church got into deliverance ministry, started casting out demons, I got prayed for by the elders of our church, and they cast out a demon of fear of stroke, all right? And as I did, I felt that whole sensation come up over me. Patty was there in the living room watching it happen. She said it looked like my tongue was bloated. It felt like it was bloated. And I felt that whole paralysis and, and left with tears and crying, and I've never had that dream since then. Five days a week for 10 or 15 years, it's now been 25 years, never had the dream. So now is this a true dream showing the true condition of my heart, or is this a lying dream? Well, I'm just going to think carefully here. I, I think it's a true dream showing the true condition. My heart had picked up a demon of fear. So the true condition of my heart was that I... It had a demon of fear attached to me, which I needed to be get gotten rid of. And my dream showed me that. Deliverance got rid of it. I'm now free. Uh, I'm sure at one point, Satan would have tried to kill me with a stroke. All right? He can't anymore. I have no fear of that anymore. All right? Because if I had a fear of it, of course, it would be faith in the power of Satan to produce that. And I don't have that anymore. Praise God. So dreams will show the unhealed condition of a heart and uh, give you a chance to go and get some prayer ministry. All right, um, reoccurring dreams, nightmares, um, all right, um, what else? Uh, people in dreams are often parts of yourself, and you ask, what's the dominant trait of that person? So if my dad shows up, his dominant trait to me, he's an entrepreneur. We're talking about the entrepreneurial part of me. If my mother shows up in a dream, chief trait of my mother, as I see her, is hospitality. She invites 50 people in for lunch and has a party, thinks it's fun, says, bring 20 more, please, you know? We're talking about the hospitable part of me. All right. If my sister shows up, we're talking about the administrative part of me because she administrates everything to the nth degree. Bless her heart. All right. So um, you, the people in your dreams are normally parts of yourself. You find out what part of yourself by asking what is the chief 
character trait of that person, and it's that part of you. Okay? Animals and dreams are often emotions. Okay? So you'd ask, what, do, what the emotion does this animal symbolize to me? All right? And there'd be different emotions that you're waging war with and needing to bring under the control of the Holy Spirit. Right? Um, dreams can come from the condition of your heart. They can come from the Holy Spirit in your heart. They can come from bodily needs. All right? If, uh, how many have uh, had a dream? In the dream, you figure that you're feeling, man, I really need to go to the bathroom. And you wake up and find out, you're right. I really do need to go to the bathroom. So a dream can reveal bodily needs. All right? We have sexual dreams. All right? And our bodies are sexual. We're all male and female. All right? And there are rhythms of sexual tension in the body. And uh, you may have a sexual dream which is showing that sexual tension that came with that rhythm. All right? That God built into your body. I don't see that that's an evil dream. That's just showing you the condition of your body. There's sexual energy in it right there, right then, that needs to be expressed. All right? I wouldn't consider that evil. Um, if a person's renewing himself with pornography, they could be having an evil sexual dream. But um, if, if dreams are symbolic, what does sexual intercourse symbolize? What would it symbolize? Intimacy, two becoming one. So if there's two warring factions within me that become one, it could, it could easily show up in a dream of sexual encounter, all right? Um, and, and that wouldn't be evil. That would be showing maturation and spiritual growth taking place within me. If my workaholic nature, my drive to have to perform, finally simmers down and the playboy part of me that wants to kick back and rest and have a party finally gets a chance to do so without me feeling guilt over it, you know, that could be spiritual maturation. I learned to lighten up a little bit. Now, I could have a dream at a point like that of me having sexual intercourse with a woman whose chief character trait was that she was laid back, all right? She was a relaxed kind of a person and not a workaholic kind of a person. I wouldn't consider that an evil dream that is showing me, in symbolic form, spiritual growth that's happening in my life. So it would only be evil if I assumed it was literal, but it's not literal because we already know one of the foundational rules is that dreams are symbolic. So if it's symbolic, it's not evil. It would only be evil if it was actually literal. Let me give you a dream that my secretary had once, years ago, and she had it more than once, actually. And we were very young in dream interpretation, so we had a hard time interpreting it the first time around. In her dream, she uh, went into her house, and she could smell smoke, and she began to look for the fire. So we, she went through the upper rooms and couldn't find the fire. She went through the lower rooms, she couldn't find the fire. She got to the kitchen, and the smoke smell was stronger. Uh, and um, she opened the upper cupboards, couldn't find the fire, opened the lower cupboards, and flames leapt out, and she awoke. And we scratched her head and said, uh, we don't know what this is about, okay? So um, we couldn't interpret it. We were very young in dream interpretation. Sometimes you don't get things. Uh, and um, so we didn't get it. And so then um, about a month later, she goes to the doctor with a physical ailment. He diagnoses it with a word this long, which is inflammation of the intestines. So... Um, how many realize the dream was telling us that a month before the doctor did? Because the doctor said, the dream said, in your house, which symbolizes what? My body. There's a fire. Okay? It's in the kitchen area, which is where we eat, which is going to symbolize what part of the body? Digestive tract. It's not in the upper cupboards, which is what part of the digestive tract? Esophagus or stomach, but it's in the lower cupboards, which is what part of the digestive tract? In the colon, there's a fire. Now, the doctor put her on a medication because he said it's a psychosomatically induced condition. He said, you got to relax. So he put her on some medication. She was over it in a few months. A year later, the dream comes back. <laughs> this time, we're smarter. We, we know what this is talking about. We, we're saying, you got inflammation here. The doctor hasn't diagnosed it, but it's coming, all right, because your dream forewarns you. And so we, if you don't relax immediately, you're going back to the doctor. She relaxed immediately and did not have to go back to the doctor again which is the purpose of a dream. It's a caution by God saying the path you're on is heading you into a ditch. Turn here. All right? And that's, that's the purpose of a dream, and that's what dreams are designed to do, to counsel me and to get me off a path and give me a mid-course correction um, so that I can get on the right path. If that's exciting, say amen. See, that's really exciting. If you'd love to take a course on dream interpretation, say amen. See, I would, and I think churches should all be offering these. You know, if you're going to counsel people, you surely want to receive the counsel of God through dreams. So you're going to, as a counselor, say, what kind of dreams have you been having recently? 
have them share their dreams and, and work with dream interpretation. As I said, you can download 20 pages free from our website on principles of dream interpretation. I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to get into a group and, and do everything in a group. You know, one can put 1,000 to flight, two can put 10,000. So don't try to learn communion with God or dream interpretation or naturally supernatural alone. Get a group around you, half a dozen or a dozen, go through the material, wrestle with it for three months, apply it, then you own it, then go on and learn something new next time around. If that sounds wise, would you say amen? See, I, I just don't like to learn anything alone, I, uh, and I haven't for years. I always find a couple people ahead of me, and uh, I start emailing, saying, come on, can we learn together? And uh, we get an email thing going for three months, and we email, we did, did this with physical healing, divine healing, a little while back. And uh, three of us who wanted to get better at healing, because we were not excited about the percentage of people who got healed when we laid hands on them, uh, we got together on the internet. One was from Pennsylvania, Frank, and uh, Gary Gregg, he was from Regent University in Virginia, and I was in Buffalo. And we just began to email back and forth and share the techniques that God had taught us to use. And uh, Frank shared his with me, and I tried them. At first, I had said, explain it in detail. You didn't explain it in detail because he's a right-brainer, so he doesn't explain anything in detail. So I said, nail this down. He said, I did. I said, no, you didn't say this or this or this. So I wrestle and get it out of him what he actually does, and then I go try it myself and say, well, that works pretty good, you know? And then I added to it what I knew, you know, and then he tried what I was doing, and it made his percent, his increase, uh, prayer percentage more effective. And mine became more effective, effective and so did Gary Greggs. All three of us, we shared ideas. We grew together. For 90 days, we just emailed back and forth about three times a week, sharing ideas, sharing successes, asking questions, and we all found our success rate improve greatly. After 90 days, it was over. Uh, we've written a book on it. You can download it free of charge from our website. It's Keys to Healing. Go to the free book section, and what we learned during that three-month period is there. Okay, So I, I try not to learn anything alone. I try to get some people, and we wrestle with it together. All right, so that's an introduction to uh, dreams and visions, and uh, we're going to make this the close of this section, and then we'll come back and do one more session on vision. Well, praise God, praise God. That was very interesting. I, I really love Paul Mark Verkler and um, his teachings, and I hope they are good for you too. Praise God. Well, any questions about tonight's lesson? Okay. Um, concerning the course on dreams and visions, we'll probably offer that as an elective when we get into the bachelor's uh, stage, which will be sometime next year. So um, if you need it right now, I can send that to you. Just hit me up with an email. Okay, everybody. Um, that's about it um, for this night. You've been wonderful, and uh, it's been a wonderful class. Any questions? Then we're going to bring the birthday girl on to lead us in prayer, and then we close out. Okay, if no one has questions, do you have comments that you want to share? All right, then we ask that you just... Um, Take a few minutes, inhale and exhale because you've heard a lot of information, a lot of interesting information. If you were like me, you were really trying to absorb it all. Um, so let's just take a minute and just kind of exhale. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your wisdom and we thank you that you love us enough that you have anointed and appointed others to help us to gain some of that wisdom and that knowledge and we thank you for what we have heard tonight for what we have seen tonight for the detailed information about the tabernacle and how our bodies relate to the tabernacle and how we should pray we thank you lord for the sharing from our students and just from their very presence though their presence is not physical we feel their presence 
with us in our spirits. So we thank you and we give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. And we ask that tonight, as we lie down to speak, that we will remember to put our journals next to our bed and that we will invoke your presence through our dreams. And then upon our awakening, we ask, Lord, that you will give us the interpretation and help us to understand it is just another way of communing with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jackie. And thank you, everybody. God bless you all.